What's up, everybody? In this video, I'm going to set you up with a solid understanding of the basics of porous absorption. This will best apply to you if you're interested in building or optimizing a home-based studio or even a professional control room that is designed for critically listening to and evaluating music, mixing, mastering, that type of thing. We're going to cover the terminology, the materials that you can use, do's, don'ts, and best practices. This is going to be a primer and we're starting from absolute ground zero, so you don't have to have any background in acoustics or physics to really get this stuff. And stay with me, because when you do get this stuff, you're going to be ahead of about 90% of people that attempt to do this. I can help you to avoid some of the most common and unfortunately really costly mistakes that people make when trying to do this. And let me tell you, a lot of people do end up making regrettable and avoidable blunders, especially when following some of the most commonly heard internet advice. This video and many more like it are part of a free acoustics course that you can access back at Warp Academy. In this course, I teach you everything from how to choose your studio monitors based on your needs and budget, how to set up your room and orient your speakers using acoustics best practices, how to do acoustic testing and how to interpret that data, how to build the right acoustic treatment and how to mount and position that acoustic treatment in your room for the best results, and then how to add a final layer on top of everything else you've done using Room EQ. This is a really fun and empowering course that will be great for you if you wanna take your studio to the next level. So hit that link just below this video and sign up for free. With that said, let's get into the video. First up, let's talk about the types of materials that you'll commonly see used. They're oftentimes wall insulation. So things like pink fluffy fiberglass, mineral rock wools, open celled foams, and even more recently, recycled denim. The key thing is that you need to be able to blow through it to various degrees depending on the density of the material. If you can't blow through it, it's not porous absorption and it won't work. Which begs the question, how exactly does porous absorption work? Let's take rock wool as an example. Rock wool has a whole bunch of tightly packed little fibers, which as the wavefront encounters, the air particles begin to navigate their way through. Now they can, you can blow through it, and that's how they get through. However, the path that the air particles have to take is now much more complex, and it slows everything down. This is called acoustic impedance or gas flow resistivity. So think about it like this. You're a runner, and you're sprinting out in the open. And then all of a sudden, you encounter a forest with a whole bunch of skinny, tightly packed trees and shrubs. You can still make your way through, but now you're having to turn left and right, up and down, you're hitting brush and foliage, and it bleeds off a lot of your speed. You can't make your way through with the same amount of velocity. Well, this is exactly how those fibers work. As the air particles begin to travel through, they have to take a more complex path, and this is known as tortuosity. So this brings us to an important law to understand, which is the law of conservation of energy, which states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it can only change forms. And so what's happening inside the porous absorption is the air particles are transferring some of their velocity into frictional losses that end up as heat. So they're hitting and contacting these fibers in the bat and vibrating them and a little bit of their energy gets lost to heat. The bat really doesn't heat up that significantly, but the velocity, some of the energy is taken away from the sound quite substantially. So that's pretty much how it works. And another layer to understand is that sound, unlike how it's graphically depicted as this sinusoidal wave, doesn't actually propagate through air like that. It actually moves through the air more like an earthworm, where it's pushing or compressing, and that's creating a lot of uh, pressure. And then there's a phase where it produces a lot of velocity. So there's always this interplay between velocity and pressure. And as the velocity is the highest, then pressure is the lowest, and they're inversely proportional to each other. So porous absorption, as you can imagine, if it relies on particle velocity, then porous absorption is going to be most effective when velocity is highest and least effective when pressure is highest because as pressure comes to its high point, velocity is zero. So where is velocity zero in a room? Well, several places, but 
it's definitely at zero at your hard boundary, so at your wall. Unfortunately, a lot of porous absorption, people recommend to place it directly on the wall. And if you place it directly on the wall where pressure is highest and velocity is the lowest, it's going to have its least amount of effect. Which brings us to air gapping. That'll be the subject for the next video, and I won't get into that now, but please do stay tuned for that one. Let's circle back to this term gas flow resistivity, or GFR. This is a term that allows you to run calculations as a studio builder and to determine what type of materials to use. So GFR is a great number to have. It's expressed in Pascal seconds per meter squared, or sometimes in rails. Those are the same unit that you can use interchangeably. Unfortunately, these numbers are really hard to get. Manufacturers of insulation often never publish these numbers, and a lot of times what you get instead is density. So let's talk about density. It should be obvious that the higher the density of the material, the higher the resistivity to gas flow, right? So if you have like a block of solid glass or a block of solid rock, there's going to be no ability to blow through that. So the resistivity is infinite at that point. And then if you have something that's super low density, like pink fluffy fiberglass, the fibers are much more spaced out, it's super light, and it's much easier for air to flow through that, so the gas flow resistivity is going to be lower. Now, I want to talk about density, because density, as it relates to gas flow resistivity, there's a sweet spot. Density versus depth is another really big concept to get. So. If you're in a room where you don't have that much space to work with, like a lot of bedroom, home-based studios, you might not have the space for really deep treatment. In that case, you might only have a couple of inches or maybe six inches to work with. And that's gonna dictate that you're gonna wanna work with a higher density material. Because if you only have a little bit of space, you're gonna get better absorption from a higher density material. Now, how dense of a material are we talking about? What type of ranges are we talking about? So this could include all the way up to and including about 128 kilograms per meter cubed. That is the highest density material that I would ever really advise using in a, in a studio. And it's something where you might see it used in a very thin ceiling cloud. So something that's one or two inches thick, or if you have wall panels and you can't lose more than one or two inches in the room, yeah, you might be able to get decent results using a super high density, rigid material like that. And an example of that material is Rockwool Comfort Board 80. It's not ideal because it's also going to reflect some energy. The, the more dense a material is, the more reflective it's going to be. That should also kind of go without saying, imagine a solid block of glass. It's going to reflect the energy back into the room. Nothing really moves through it or gets absorbed. So now let's talk about if you have more space, because it's actually much better if you have a bit more room to work with and you use a lower density material. So in my control room, we built it for optimal acoustics. We had a lot of space to work with. And on the back wall, which was critical for absorbing as much of the sub energy as possible, we used three and a half feet of porous absorption. And we used multiple layers, but the majority of that back wall was made of very low density, low GFR, pink fluffy fiberglass by Owens Corning. So it's generally the rule where if you have the space to work with, it's much better to work with a deeper amount of low density material than a smaller depth of higher density material due to the reflection aspect. Where do you thread the needle on this stuff? If you have, you know, six inches or a foot to work with, you could probably go with something that is like rock wool comfort bat that is 32 kilograms per meter cubed. That's one that we do have the gas flow resistivity on and it's 10,000 Pascal seconds meter squared or rails. So that's a number that you can actually acoustically model, 10,000. And then from there, we can get GFR numbers from materials that are higher and lower density. I actually built a calculator in a spreadsheet to be able to run those numbers and it's included in my free acoustics course as a download. So make sure that you grab that below this video. The final thing I wanna say about this is, and this is getting bridging into a little bit more advanced stuff, but I think it's worth mentioning, is the concept of graduated density. So rather than using one material, that's say either low or high density, it's oftentimes better if you have the space 
to be able to use a material that's higher density for the first little bit and then lower density for the remainder. So to circle back to the example of my control room and the back wall base trapping, we used rock wool comfort bat for the first layer. So that's 32 kilograms per meter cubed, uh, which is a medium density material. And then for the remaining majority of the trap, we used the much lighter density pink fluffy fiberglass. And that worked great because you get kind of this membrane effect, kind of like a pressure based treatment. To wrap this up and land the plane, the range of materials that you will typically be working with could be anywhere from say 20 kilograms per meter cubed all the way up to 128 kilograms per meter cubed. A lot of acousticians like one of my mentors, Philip Newell, AES author of Recording Studio Design, he only uses materials in the range of 40 kilograms per meter cubed all the way up to 80 kilograms per meter cubed. But he's designing professional control rooms that are purpose-built from the ground up. If you're doing a home-based studio and you only have a couple inches or, or six inches to work with, you may want to consider using a higher density material. And if you have a lot of space to work with, you might consider using a lower density material with a layer of higher density material on the surface. I hope that makes sense. Please do ask me if you have any questions about that and let's move on. The next big subject to talk about is area of coverage. So it's one thing to know what type of material you want to work with. It's another thing to know how much of your room to cover with it. So this really depends on what your goals are with the room. Now, in this video, I'm assuming that you are wanting to build a room for critical listening, mixing, mastering, engineering music, that kind of thing. It's not like a listening room where you're trying to enjoy movies or hi-fi listening. That's very different. So I'm going to assume this is kind of a pseudo control room scenario where you really need to be able to make objective decisions about the music. And in that case, what you're going to want to do is have very controlled decay times. A lot of people incorrectly refer to decay times in music studios as RT60, which is a reverberation time calculation to show how it takes, how long it takes for the sound to fall in energy, 60 decibels. The types of rooms we're talking about here don't meet the criteria for a reverberant sound field. So we actually use the term T60, which is just decay time. And sometimes it'll be T20 or T30. And all that means is it's the amount of time that it takes in milliseconds, typically, for the sound energy in the room, the SPL, to be able to fall by 20, 30, or 60 decibels. So T60 is a number that's oftentimes used for studio or control room design. So what type of numbers should you be shooting for? And then how does that tie in with your area of coverage? So if you're talking about a larger room, like an actual purpose-built control room or like a family room, then you would be looking at somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5 seconds. So 200 to 500 milliseconds. A lot of times you get a rise where it's longer below about 250 hertz. And that's just because low frequency energy is more difficult to rein in because of the frequency component of it. If you're dealing with a smaller room, like a small control room in a studio, or maybe you're dealing with a bedroom or something like that, the smaller the room, the shorter the decay time that you are going to want. So maybe 0.1 to 0.2 or 0.3 seconds, so 100 to 300 milliseconds would be a good decay time goal for a very small room. Now, how does that tie in with area of coverage? Well, you're just not gonna get there with these little two foot by four foot wall mounted panels because area of coverage matters. When they test acoustical materials, they test them on the floor of a reverberation chamber and they test to see how those materials impact the reverberation time in the chamber. And the greater the area of coverage, the more of an impact that you get. So if you really want to approach control room type acoustics, which is totally possible, by the way, you're gonna to wanna to increase your area of coverage. If you don't care about that, then sure, you can just use the little wall mounted panels, maybe some base traps in the corners and you're gonna be okay. But if you wanna get more serious than that and you really wanna get more towards these engineering control room style acoustics, then you're gonna to wanna to go floor to ceiling. So you're gonna to wanna to have a module that is at least five and a half inches thick and stretches all the way from your floor to your ceiling. 
and that is going to give you a much greater area of coverage or total sabins of absorption. Sabins is just the unit that is used for acoustical testing to be able to figure out how much total absorption there is. In my acoustics course, I really walk you through the process of building what I think are the most effective DIY acoustic panels. They are the majority of what I've used in this room and they're extremely effective. They're about 250 bucks a panel to build and you can strap them into your room very quickly and easily and they really get you that area of coverage that you're going to be looking for if you want to get down into those numbers that I was talking about. The other neat thing about these panels is they are very easy to air gap from the wall. And again, that's not in scope for this video, but the next one we're going to talk about air gapping, but it's a big topic, important to understand. These panels make air gapping really easy. And the other thing is that they cover your corners of your room. So every time you have a seam in your room, that's where base energy builds up. So between your floor and your walls and your walls and your ceiling, that's where your base energy is going to build up. So these panels get into those corners. Okay, kudos to you for making it through this video. There is a lot of information to understand here, and if your head's spinning, that's normal. You can rewind the video, watch it a few more times, and when this stuff really lands, you are going to be able to put it into practice. I am planning on making a higher level, more advanced video on this topic because there is more information. Stay tuned on the channel to see when that one comes out. But if you're kind of keen to get working with this stuff and, and level up your studio, then I would encourage you to check out the series that I did on how to build these floor to ceiling acoustic modules that I personally use and are extremely effective. And I think they're the ultimate modules to be able to use in your studio to get similar to control room level acoustics. If you're ready to get building, just click the link below. It'll take you back to my free acoustics course where you can download the PDF that will walk you through everything and you can see detailed build guides on exactly how to do that. Up next, as I promised, we're gonna be talking about air gapping. Air gapping is such a key topic to understand because it can radically improve the low frequency absorption performance of these types of panels that we're talking about using. And as we mentioned in this video, the low frequency energy can be some of the most difficult difficult to attenuate in your studio just because of the amount of power that it has, right? So if you want to learn about air gapping, which I suggest you do, watch the next video. I'm going to cover what is it, if you choose to do it, how do you do it, what are the best practices, all that jazz. Let's hop into it. I'll catch you there.